Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Well, you know, it's been a little little busy, a little crazy around here and what have you, and I know that we haven't been able to get into a, a good routine as far as being able to produce the podcast on a timely basis and um, and what have you. And, and the more that I have, have thought about it and, and put everything into perspective and what needs to be done when and why and all that other good stuff, uh, this week we're going to do the best of. And uh, next week, I think uh, I think it's time to um, address our, our our audience, our core audience, with a with an announcement that uh, will kind of change the change the landscape here a little bit. Well, today we're going to be getting our way back machine, and we're going to go back five years ago to 2019 to an episode that Bruce and I recorded together. We're going to be talking about the rock stone cold Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. And, uh, well, we'll be talking about how they're all leaving just around backlash 2004. So sorry about the audible folks. Obviously things uh, are changing and, uh, it feels like this was probably inevitable and, uh, Bruce will give us the good, the bad and the ugly next week, but at least for today. Let's talk about backlash 2004. It's a conversation that Bruce and I had in 2019 and we'll see you guys hopefully next week, right Rock here. On. Something to wrestle.com. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. And you're listening to something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Who's coming to us live from Stanford, Connecticut. What's going on, Bruce? How are you? Actually, I'm in, as, as they say, up in Canada, uh, I'm actually in Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, or as the locals call it, Greenwich. So, beautiful day here, as a matter of fact. I'm, I'm, I'm looking out at, at, the, uh, at the air conditioning system here. It's wonderful. Well, I'm excited that you're in Greenwich, and I know that you're up there with all your snobby friends. I think those are uh, the main streets that Hunter Hearst Helmsley used to roam back in the day. Did he not? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. They're the mean, they're, they are probably the meanest damn streets anywhere in the world. Well, hence for, the name. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you just can't make that shit up. I mean, the mean streets of Connecticut are as mean as they get. Well, we are, uh, we are lean and mean this week here as we are covering backlash 2004, but before we get there, we ought to circle back to last week and uh, recap a little bit of Austin 98, 99. I think the most talked about thing on the show was my beard. Uh, we, uh, we tried taping these shows on the road a few different ways. When I was in Japan at the beginning of the year, I used my Apple AirPods as a mic and you guys hated the way that sounds. So I tried a wired pair of headphones from great friend of the show, Mr. Jeff Jones. And, uh, apparently my beard wound up eating most of the show. So, uh, we're going to do our best to make this week sound a little better, but again, Bruce is on the road, but we, uh, we've heard your feedback. Uh, it was loud and clear last week. You guys would rather have great sound quality consistently as opposed to new content consistently. Uh, so we're in the process of putting together some best of shows. So the next time we have a travel situation, what you are treated with will at least be uh, quality sound and it won't be as scratchy, but today you're still coming to us from a hotel room in the main streets of Greenwich, because it's our only option. You're uh, busier than a one arm paper hanger, man. A little bit. Yes. Yes. We both are. So we're, we're kind of all over the country, but we're, but you know what? We're still dedicated. We're still going to do whatever the hell it takes to get something out and, uh, make it new and refreshing every week. And sometimes our time is limited. You know, it's, it's, you have a window, I have a window and we're doing the very best we can folks, but I appreciate everybody hanging in and, and bearing with us and not totally hating us. Well, I didn't notice your, I, when we were recording, I didn't even notice your beer, beer ruffling. Even when I started to get the feedback, I clicked around a few spots and I didn't hear it either, but I know it's there. So we posted a diagram and an explanation, but we're still getting <laughs> feedback. But, uh, no, after, after five hours of this for five years, I have not started eating into the microphone. 
I know I'm fat, but Jesus. Uh, and I, and I was not at a poker table. You didn't hear anyone raise or lower or, or yell That's cigarettes. That's what I wanted like, to know. What, what, where did that come from? It's the quietest poker table ever. Like no one's raising nothing. Like, come on, let's, let's be real. Uh, but either way we're here now I'm back home in Huntsville, Alabama. I've been in my own bed for like five nights in a row. I don't know what to think. I'm so well rested. That is not the case for you. I'm just rubbing it in. Uh, now but, you're bragging. Yeah. I was just going to say, now you're just being mean. Yeah. It's nice to, uh, be on my regular microphone too. I'm not over modulating last week. Whenever I would raise my voice, it would just blow out the settings in my laptop in Adobe. So we're back to normal this week and we're covering the 15 year anniversary of backlash 2004. And, uh, just yesterday was the 15 year anniversary of this show. It went down on April 18th at Rexall place in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada drew 13,000 fans. And this is the sixth backlash pay-per-view. And this is a raw brand pay-per-view. Uh, I think this is one of the only times that Edmonton ever got a pay-per-view. Do you know, uh, as our friend hurricane would say, what's up with that? A happy accident. And it was, you know, not a lot of planning, but the fact that it was Chris Benoit's hometown worked out really, really well from everything that we were doing creatively with Benoit just getting the championship, the world championship. So this is one of those that you have to chalk up. There is a really good, happy accident, a happy coincidence. Yeah, we are, um. We're excited whenever a pay-per-view comes to the South because we don't get them a ton. So I feel your pain, Edmonton. Uh, we're coming off WrestleMania 20, which we did just a, a couple of weeks ago. It's available in the archives. Now at something to wrestle.com. Chris Benoit comes out of WrestleMania 20 as the new heavyweight champion. Of course, he defeated triple H and Shawn Michaels in a triple threat match to win the title. Uh, he made triple H tap out to win that match. And famously Benoit is from Edmonton. I guess this begs the question when you guys scheduled Edmonton for this pay-per-view, did you already know, Hey, we're going to put the title on Benoit and we're going to go there or was the, was the building book so far in advance and, and it was just all a blessing in disguise. Yeah. The booking was done way in advance. So it was all a very, very good, happy accident. And one of those situations where things, everything lined up but the decision hadn't really clearly been made as far as Benoit being the champion when this thing was booked. So no, it wasn't done to, Hey, Chris Benoit is going to be the champion. Let's have something in his hometown. It was the moon and the stars and everything aligning just right. That it made sense. Well, I do want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, when you know that you've got like the hometown hero coming in as champion, what do you guys line up from a PR standpoint differently? Is that guy doubling down on all the press stuff? Does he go in a week early and hit all the local radio and TV and newspapers? It does feel like he would try to line it up, you know, a hero's welcome and, and get a feel good story locally as well. Right. Any and everything that you possibly can. And it helps from the standpoint locally, they all want him. They all want him. They all want to talk about the hometown boy that made good. So they're already requesting it. We're getting it out there every way that we can. So it, it was, it was good. The fact that Chris, and I even believe that, that Chris still had a place there and was, was going back and forth. So it was to that end that worked out really well. And people knew him and Chris wasn't one that always went out and did a lot of that stuff it was good practice for him as well because Chris wasn't the best on the microphone. He wasn't one of those guys that was over the top. This was a chance for him to get out of his comfort shell and for him to be able to get out in front of audiences and tell his story and let people get to know, you know, the, the, that real guy. How do you think he was, um, adjusting to being the world champion? You know, we hear, not so much now, but back in the day, we used to hear that Vince always had or wanted to have a special relationship with his champion, that they would talk every day, that they would be very close. And Vince still took that, that honor of, of making someone champion very seriously and felt like they were sort of the face of the company. And a lot of guys have talked about the stress of, you know, carrying that, that weight of the responsibility of the, the success, the highs and lows, as it were of the WWE or WWF at the time. And that could be a bit of a grind. H how was Benoit 
in that role 30 days in here? Still learning. And I don't know that that was ever anything that Chris was ever completely comfortable with. It was something that Vince did work a lot with him on personally, but Chris, he wrestled in the ring. That's what he did best. And that is what, you know, made his name for him. That's what people loved him for. So for him to go and verbalize that a lot of times, that was difficult. That was difficult for him. And that was something that Vince did, did work with him an awful lot. And, you know, you get the very best that you can out of it. And it was a slow process, but the only way you're going to get better, no better. I mean, no different than how you get better in the ring is repetition. The only way you're going to get better at doing media interviews and speaking in front of large audiences is actually doing it. Go out there, flub up a few times and do what you have to do, but then you're going to be more comfortable. And when you're comfortable, it's better. Let's talk about, you know, the, the, the mission to sort of make him, you know, it does feel a little bit like a paradigm shift for the company. And I'm putting words in your mouth here. So I want you to set the record straight. I wasn't there. You were, but it feels like the company's in a bit of a transition, you know, with no competition with WCW and ECW going under in 2001, it feels like Oh two and Oh three very much became transitional years where you're trying to find sort of the new norm. You've got a a stacked and loaded roster. You're trying new things with, you know, Steve Austin or with Hulk Hogan by the time Oh four rolls around. It feels like you've settled into something new business has certainly taken a dip and you're trying to sort of find your way. And it feels like there's a bit of a paradigm shift from Vince McMahon. So there is this raw brand split and now you've got, you know, raw on one side, SmackDown on the other and coming out of WrestleMania 20, instead of going with two or even one more traditional heritage champion, you've got really two projects, Eddie Guerrero and SmackDown. And Chris Benoit on raw, you're trying two new things, pushing two new, totally top guys. Is that a response from Vince thinking we need to shake things up, pal, let's try something different. Or is it just, am I reading too much into that? No, it was time that we had to change things up and we were going to try something new. I, I go back to, you know, 1993 with Bret Hart and Hulk was gone. It was an opportunity where Vince looked at it. We, we had gone from, you know, Hogan to Savage to flair to warrior to all these different talent that were very, very flamboyant and very out there. They were all proven top stars to Bret Hart. And the idea was, okay, we are going to make Bret this top star. So the mindset in the company became, Everything that we did with Brett was, what would we do if it was Hulk? That was the mindset. Whatever you have to do, you you get him on The Tonight Show. You get him on Good Morning America. Whatever it is that you have to do, that's what we want to do with our new champion. Same thing here. It was prior to this, it was Stone Cold Steve Austin. It was The Rock. And those were the big stars that had driven the company probably 10 years before, well, not even 10 years before, but they were the most recent that people related to and that everyone compared everyone else to. This was a, well, if if he was Steve Austin, what would we do? And you had to, you had to look at it partially like that, but at the same time, it's, we don't want him to be Steve Austin. Right. We don't want him to be the rock. We want them to be, you know, Eddie Guerrero. We want him to be Chris. It, and it was a subtle, you know, it was subtleties. It was, we wanted all the same opportunities, but to create different, a little bit different persona, not that over the top beer drinking, hell raising stone cold, Steve Austin or the pie eating smack downing rock. It was now hola chico, uh, <laughs> with Eddie Guerrero and a straightforward business, you know, wrestler athlete in Chris Benoit. Well, it does feel like you guys are trying to sort of establish him or reestablish him or cement him as the top guy, whatever it may be, because you're coming back here with a rematch from WrestleMania 20, which is a little rare, I guess, you know, we're going to be back on top triple H Sean Michaels, Chris Benoit. Why the decision to go back to the same match? 
a couple of reasons. Uh, one was to get the get the victory over the other guy, that being Shawn Michaels. And it was a great match. The The story didn't end at WrestleMania. It was just another chapter at WrestleMania to crown the new champion. And now to solidify that champion. What better way to, to solidify him than to be both guys that were in that triple threat and really establish him as this is the guy. Now he beat your two top stars in, you know, basically one match. It was two matches, but still, you know what I mean? It was three. It was a triple threat. You didn't beat the the weak guy. You beat the two strongest guys. And that solidified him as world champion. All right. Let's take a time out right now, Bruce, and tell everybody about prize picks. They're America's number one fantasy sports app. They've got more than 3 million members, and that's because it's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stat and and, and, and watch the winnings roll in. It really is that simple. We just had the big UFC 300. Man, I had some fun with prize picks on that. I loved it during college basketball season, and now it's about to get heated up for the NBA. Right now, you can win 100 extra money on prize picks with as little as just four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 bucks with basketball, hockey, and more, all at prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. I'm pumped man. that the playoffs are here, man. Well, yeah, and it's not just the playoffs, man. Prize picks has something for every sport from, from basketball and hockey to League of Legends and every single thing in between. You can pick LeBron, Caitlin Clark, Connor McDavid, Gene Bellingham, all in the same entry. It's the best way to get action on sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. It's awesome. I love it because they take Apple Pay, so it's easy to make deposits. They've also got quick and easy withdrawals, but they've got really fun weekly promotions too, like Taco Tuesday, where you get even more value. Hey, speaking of more value, Prize Picks, as a matter of fact, I believe this is true. They're the only outfit who offers injury insurance. Let me explain. Let's say you have a player who exits in the first half of the game and they don't return in the second. Well, Prize Picks has your back, and that will not count as a loss. How about that? Your entries stay in play even if one of your guys gets injured. I never heard of anybody else doing that. Go check it out right now. I'm telling you, you'll be so glad you did. I'm a big fan of Prize Picks. Think you will be too. Download the app today. Use our code WRESTLE. You'll get a first deposit match of up to 100 bucks. That's right. Download the Prize Picks app today and use that code WRESTLE. You'll get a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Well, let's talk about some some company news and notes heading into this pay-per-view. On March 20th, we see the WWE draft, and we're just coming off of the superstar shakeup in current day WWE. Uh, I know we're not going to talk about current stuff, but I'm going to get a lot of heat if I don't say, and you, I know you're going to pass. What the fuck is the Viking experience? Who booked this shit? Uh, anyway, w- why did they eliminate the draft concept and start doing the superstar shakeup? Uh, because this is, um, you know, the draft was fun and, but it was a more traditional sports feel. Now it's a little more randomized. Do you know why Vince maybe changed his, his flavor on that? Actually, I really don't. I think it was just to do something different and create an um, unpredictable atmosphere. They had done the draft and everything, and now it's it's a shakeup, and it's the same concept. The only thing is you're not getting the, the draft picks and that drama of someone and who are they going to pick. Uh, it's still the drama of where are people going to end up, but different. Let's talk about the draft back in the day. How did you guys decide who was going where? Is it all just sort of whatever Vince's feel is? Do people campaign one way or another? Hey, we think this guy should be there and here's why. And then they list potential feuds or issues or what's that process look like? Painful. Uh, (laughs) Well, you know, you start with, you start with your talent rosters and you take a look at who is, who's on what show, who's identifiable with what show there were. There were some talent that 
you just, for example, early on, Steve Austin was all about Monday Night Raw and Rock was all about SmackDown. So the, the feeling was they had to remain on those shows. There were some talent that just were identifiable with the brand that they were on. You would take a look at your, your talent rosters and you say, okay, this guy's been here a while. How does he benefit with a move over to the other brand? So let's say if you're, we're looking at SmackDown, how does XYZ benefit by going over to the Raw brand? What new matchups do we have that we could create on the Raw brand and vice versa? So you're constantly looking at what what's going to be new and does it work? Does it gel more than anything? It, it's you can switch people all day long, but then if they don't gel and you can't have good creative matchups, then, you know, it's not going to work. The other, the other issue was raw was live and SmackDown was taped. So there was that element too. who performs better live, who is, you know, maybe can benefit from having a taped show where they can go ahead and maybe screw up and it can be edited. It can be fixed. So those, all, all of that comes into play. Then you take your writing teams, people responsible for Raw, people responsible for SmackDown, and they do, we would do a legitimate um, draft and just say, hey, we want this guy. And, and okay, what do you have for this? And kind of go back and forth. You had, to, you had to work together. You had to work together, otherwise it wouldn't work. We did shoot drafts where we would start and build each team would build their dream roster. Oh this is who God. I want. So you did, you did like a fantasy football draft for wrestling. Right. And, and each, and each group would do their, their, this is my ideal. This is the roster I want. Now you got to go and, and negotiate. <laughs> Like, oh, that guy can't work with that guy. This one, yeah. Do you really think this match is going to work? Um, and then both sides kind of pitch and you pitch Vince, and, and Vince looks at it, and, and Vince is feeling who he wants on which brands, and you take it from there. And then you, it's like putting a, a giant puzzle together where the pieces never actually, you still got to force some in and bend the corner a little bit to make it fit. But it's a gigantic puzzle that is um, not the easiest thing in the world to do because even after you get it all done, there's still changes. And um, it's, a, it's a constant – that's where we came up with you know, the draft. And then uh, the draft will continue while trades and other things happen because you still wanted the ability to be flexible and kind of – Okay, this, you know what, this doesn't look as good now that I had, you know, it looked really good in the store, but now I got it home and I put it on and it doesn't look as good on me. Um, we gave ourselves time to make those changes. Let's talk a little bit about how you communicate with the different guys, you know, who's going where, because through the years, it's been said that some guys didn't know they were being moved until it was announced on TV, but I'm sure that wasn't the case with some top guys. How do you decide one way or another? Like, does Vince say, Hey, let's not tell Jr. he's going to smack down, but Hey, before we do anything with Steve Austin, we need to run it past him. I would say that 98% did not know. Vince wanted to keep that so close to the vest that he wanted it to be a 100% surprise and an honest reaction from the talent as well as everyone else that we held that thing so closely to the vest that we would bring everyone in. And when it would, would be time to make the announcement, you would have the guy that's going to be drafted along with six or seven other guys standing by hear your name go. Is there any consideration when you guys are having these conversations about this person's moving here or there as to I know you're going to almost laugh this off, but I think it's a valid question who people ride with and travel with. Like if someone has been a, a riding buddy with this guy for years and years and they're, they're travel companions, they share cars, they share rooms, the whole deal. And now you're going to make a change. Is that even considered? And if so, or if not, either way, 
is it still a surprise to them? Or, or do you say, Hey, just so you know, next week may be a little different because we're thinking about making a change or is that too a surprise? And Vincent didn't really care if, you know, they split up, a cause in some of these situations, there's couples. So it's a man and a woman who are together in real life and they travel on the road together. And that obviously is, is convenient. And then if one gets moved to another show, now they're, they're living totally separate lives. Yeah. As far as if someone was married, yes, there was consideration given to that other than, other than marriage. Um, no, because you can't look at that. If you, if you look at that, then how, how in the hell do you do that? Well, this person rides with that guy. They really like splitting rooms or they, they, this guy is the best wheel man. You, you can't. And that's just life. If you were in, in any other job or somebody that you hung out with and you went out with all, every night, whatever, and all of a sudden you get transferred, well, you got to make, now it's time to make new friends and you make new writing buddies and you change up the way that you operate on the road. That's, that's life. And that's just business. Uh, with the exception of if someone was married, we tried to keep them together. But other than that, cause come on, I mean, people are, if they're dating or seeing one another, uh, they could be seeing one another one week and the next week be seeing someone else. So that did not come into it. Um, pretty much only married was something that we looked at and said, okay, we're going to try and keep them together. And sometimes, you know, it didn't work, but for the most part, that was the one consideration that we gave, but guys riding together and hanging. No, um, that did not enter into the equation. Let's, uh, let's keep it moving here. This draft show from 2004 does a 4.5 rating, which was the highest of any of the other two draft shows that happened before. Uh, Paul Heyman is the GM of SmackDown. Eric Bischoff is running raw and they do these randomized, uh, draws where they're pulling these balls from a machine with wrestlers names inside of them. So it's old school, Royal rumble style, almost like a lottery. Uh, what do you think of, uh, whenever they would do these randomized names i mean obviously it's you know tongue in cheek we know the deal but that's kind of fun huh yeah it is because now you're adding the element of the general manager doesn't have as much control over who's going to be drafted you're at the luck of the draw and it's now it's a lottery versus an actual draft so that was fun because it was again you throw in the unpredictability of it and what the hell could happen anything could happen at any time and Hey, we did those exercises too. <laughs> you know, just like I said before, where we've actually just thrown one through 30 in a bin and had guys pick for certain wrestlers to see where they would end up in the Royal Rumble. We, we did the same thing with the lottery. What if? And a lot of times that's mental masturbation because it doesn't matter, but it's, it's fun to do to break up the monotony a little bit of, what, hey, this could actually happen. So let, let's play this scenario out. What if they drew this? So you have to play all that shit out and, and look at every single side of it and how it affects business. Let's talk a little bit about what actually, what actually happened that night. Rene Dupree gets drafted uh, to SmackDown. Shelton Benjamin drafted to raw Jindrak going to SmackDown Nidia to raw. Excuse me. Triple H to SmackDown, Rhino to Raw, Rob Van Dam to SmackDown, Tajiri to Raw, and before the Triple H pick to SmackDown, we saw people drafted who weren't necessarily main eventers but were big names at the time. Did you guys try to set that up just to get their names out there in hopes it would help them somewhat, or you know, are you trying to elevate everybody in a draft? Or because you are having people like Teddy Long going to SmackDown, Spike Dudley going to SmackDown, they're not necessarily you know, major, uh, you know, names necessarily on the show, but them being featured in a spot like this is a chance to, as you would say, give them a fresh paint of coat. No, it's totally random Conrad. It's just, we were oh, drawing sure. balls. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it, it was it, the anticipation of when you, 
you hear guys, maybe not main eventers, top guys, but they're interesting and, and they're moving from their norm. So you're thinking, okay, well, how are they going to fit over there? You're trying to play the, the audience here as well to think, what's this guy going to do in a new environment? Then you, you hit them with a bigger name and they go, oh shit, that's a big one. And people are going, all right, now this is getting interesting. Conrad, how is the official something to wrestle with dog doing? Well, What's of course, I'm the only one that can answer that question, right? Because it is Bean, my little Bean baby, and she is the absolute best dog. And a lot of people would just say, well, man, she's nothing but a mutt. But within Bark, I found out she is much more than an ordinary mutt. All right. She is the sweetest little puppy dog that you ever want to see. And Bark will help you find out exactly what breed or what mix of breed that your dog is. And the bottom line is this, okay? You get a puppy, whether you adopt it. I like adopting puppies. And you take your dog, take a little swab, and you send it in to Embark. And Embark is the most accurate dog DNA test on the market. And it's the ultimate gift for every occasion if you've got a pet lover in your gift giving list. Okay. The uh the joy man of wondering because you know look we've got a big family we've got a bunch of dogs but the joy of the guessing game and we all put ours actually we wrote down what we thought dog would be and put it in a thing whoever came closest then they won the pot and our bean experience was you you, you get a full printout and bean turned out she's 64.2 percent american pit bull terrier she's 21 or 22.1 australian catalog and she's 13.7 percent american bulldog and when you read up and they give you the information about every dog that is in your dog's DNA, you get to see those traits come out in your dog. And it makes it actually a whole heck of a lot more enjoyable. When Bean backs up into us and she's like goes to sit down on us, that's her way of letting her know that or letting us know that she's ready to play. It's like she'll back up, she'll have a toy in her hand and she's ready to play. She wants you to take it and throw it for her. So, that's one little thing, and that's that's part of a bulldog. That's something that a bulldog does. She will go, and she will take and nudge our other dogs along because that's the cattle dog, and she has got the greatest temperament, and it's all because of Embark, and the waiting for the Embark information is kind of like as if you were pregnant, and you're waiting to find out what you were going to have, a boy or a girl, and Embark does it all. So it's... Not your just regular gift, okay? It's something that everybody in the family can participate in. You don't need an occasion to know when you're to know your dog better. If you're gifting your dog by better understanding his, her, or needs, that's a great thing to do. Get the dog DNA test that is trusted by millions right now. Embark has a limited time offer on their breed and health test for our listeners. Go to EmbarkVet.com and get a free shipping and save $50 with promo code WRESTLE. Visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code WRESTLE to save $50 today. I did, you should, and you won't regret it. Let's keep it moving here. Uh, I do want to talk about an interesting pick. Paul Heyman, who is the SmackDown GM, is drafted to Raw, and then he quits. What do you remember about that? I will not be on the red brand. My brand is blue, which is why I only wear blue towels, and I drip dry after I shower. Sometimes I lather up with all temperature. Um... <laughs> storyline and the idea behind it was again that shocking moment of the smackdown general manager wait a minute the fucking general managers are in this thing too so it, it made people talk and then the idea of, and i believe it was even paul's idea to say well what if i just quit what if i didn't want to go to raw 
and, and I just quit. And that was why we played that out. And that was a storyline that that kind of resonated because y- you hear guys all the time, football or whatever. If I get drafted to here or if I get picked or traded to go somewhere else, I'll just quit. Very few ever do. You know, it's usually just a bunch of talk and shit to get people talking about things. But this was one, okay, you know, Paul quits. I will not do that, sir. And uh, that was the idea behind it and just let the storyline gradually go on until Paul reappears somewhere else. Wade Keller would report in The Torch, after a longer stint at SmackDown GM than originally anticipated, Paul Heyman has been moved out of that role in favor of Kurt Angle. Heyman originally was slated to be replaced last fall by Stephanie McMahon, who for now will remain in an off air role in the creative department. Heyman has been acting very cocky on air as part of his character, referring to Paul Heyman's SmackDown so often that it almost gave away that the show wouldn't be his much longer. The plan for Heyman is for him to return in several weeks after selling the quitting angle and become a manager. Heyman has been so strong with his mic work lately, especially at house shows that he may be a key in getting over some young wrestlers with a lot of potential, but lacking main event mic skills. Uh, we've done a, uh, a Paul Heyman episode in the past. It's filmed in the archives. It's something to wrestle.com, but can it be overstated how strong Paul Heyman was and is on the mic? No, I don't think it can. I think that Paul Heyman is, is the best on the mic right now that that is and and probably he will be up there in in the Bobby Heenan category is greatest managers of all time and it may be Bobby Heenan and Paul Heyman Heyman has just solidified Paul has a way of telling you a story and bringing everything to where the littlest of detail is the major point uh, and making everything mean something. So he had that skill then. He has that skill now. I dare say he's gotten better over the years. But Paul took a company like ECW and was able to exploit very limited skills with guys and make it work. And and it, and he made it work for a while. Uh, didn't make any money, but still, he. that's one skill that is – often overlooked with Paul that, that he is able to get the most out of as little as possible. Let's talk about, uh, the next match on the show. Triple H comes down to the ring wearing a SmackDown shirt and he wrestles the WWE champion, Eddie Guerrero for the title. It's going to be their first and only match against each other on TV. And, And that in my research really stood out to me. Was it ever talked about them doing a program together? It's pretty crazy to think that they didn't really have that much interaction. They didn't have that many matches. That could have been a really fun feud. God, I, I think it would have been an incredible issue. I, th- there was so much there to work with. And unfortunately, you know, we got one out of it and that was it before Hunter went back to raw. And at the same time, you know, you kind of look at it. They were so strong, both characters, were so strong it would have been a little tough too but for me i thought that it brought out the very best in eddie and for hunter it showed that he could work with any and everybody and it was unfortunately we just got one out of it and i thought that the one we got out of it was tremendous let's keep it moving here um eddie wins the match by dq Flair and Batista interfere, and then several wrestlers get involved. It's a big schmoz, a big brawl. Uh, Hunter doesn't stay on SmackDown, and he never actually appears on it after the draft because he is immediately traded back to Raw. Uh, is this one of those that looked better in the store, or did Hunter campaign to go back to Raw? No, it was one of those that looked better in the store, and I think that once Vince got a look at, at SmackDown and Raw, and he's thinking, hmm... I think raw needs triple H and he wanted to make that. And we're like, well, I thought the idea was that we're building, you know, we're going to build some of these guys up. He says, yeah, but I need a, (laughs) I need established talent to build them up, which I understand that as well. So the idea was, well, nah, we'll we'll just put it back on raw. (laughs) We're thinking, 
okay, you know, you, you do what you have to do. It was, it was a little bit of once you saw it, and like I say, once we got it there and everything, it's like, hmm, now that I'm looking at Raw and I'm looking at SmackDown, SmackDown's loaded, Raw needs needs something else. He didn't want to take away from a traditional SmackDown talent or he didn't want to move Eddie or anything like that because of the similarities with Benoit and felt that Benoit had had been on SmackDown long enough, didn't want to make that change, so he put Hunter back on Raw. Just felt that was stronger. You know, this... I don't know why that surprises me, but it does sound very ready, shoot, aim. I mean, isn't that a weird thing to do? Like, you lay all this groundwork down, and you say, this is what I'm going to do, and you make a big to-do about the draft, and then once you do it, you immediately say, oh, I don't like that, change my mind. I mean... Is, is that not a ready, shoot, aim approach? Sometimes, but also that's the beauty of live television. And that's the beauty of, of being able to have a show every single week that you can make those adjustments and, and change. So it, it's but a lot it, of times you'll, you'll look at something that looks great on paper and, and by God, you're explaining this whole thing and you have this visual in your head and we're going to do this. And here's this new finish that we're going to create for this guy. And he's going to fucking pick him up and blah, blah, blah. And then you see it and, and it, and you go, okay, but you know what? It'll be better when there's people in the building and, and the excitement and then the people get in the building, the excitement, you go, that just doesn't work. And that was, that's, that was the feeling. And, the again, that's the beautiful luxury of being live and being able to change every single week if you need to. I mean, I get that, but at the same time, doesn't it cheapen the excitement and take away from some of the quote unquote stakes, as Eric Bischoff would say, of a draft? If you can just immediately undo it, like, why well, get all that excited about a shakeup if we're immediately going to undo it? Well, we didn't, we only undid one guy, so. Yeah. So let's mention he was drafted by Paul Heyman to join SmackDown, then traded by Kurt Angle back to raw in exchange for Booker T and the Dudleys. Um, Wade Keller would write Hunter switch to SmackDown was treated on television as the biggest story coming out of the draft lottery. Well ahead of any other moves, only edges switch to raw was treated as a major happening otherwise. And the SmackDown locker room was relieved to hear that Hunter wasn't staying on their roster as Hunter as seen as being so politically powerful. It changes the dynamic of the roster, more chummy atmosphere, um, among the SmackDown wrestlers as compared to the raw wrestlers chat me up. Did you get a vibe or a sense that SmackDown had a looser, more carefree locker room than raw did? I think in general they did, because again, you look at the show, the show being taped, there wasn't that immediacy to that. And there was a little bit more relaxed from the standpoint of, uh, you know, if we screw something up, we can fix it. So the, the pressure wasn't on as much in those days from that standpoint on raw, man, you, you, you had to be on, it was live. You had to fucking hit it. You had to nail it every single week. And that pressure's there for some of the younger guys that have never felt that that's a lot of fucking pressure. And then when you're on SmackDown, you have, you've got a net underneath you. So as far as the, the mood in the locker room and the different, different feel. Yeah, there was definitely a different feel. And when you get to raw, man, it was more intense because it was live. It was gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. And you gotta hit your, you gotta hit your times. If you go over three minutes on raw, you fuck up the whole show. Or you go under, you fuck up the show. If that happens on SmackDown, it's like, okay, you're, I'm pissed off, but at the same time, we can fix it. I can go back in post and we can add something or we can take something out. And it's not as do or die. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what Wade Keller wrote here. Cause I'm curious your opinion on this, because this is something that's been stated as fact for a long time. Hunter remaining on raw did cement raw's reputation within WWE as being the number one priority of Vince McMahon and those in power. Since Hunter is clearly the top WWE wrestler, despite not holding a world title and it's the last full-time active top tier player from the Monday night war era. 
Uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on whether or not Hunter was the top wrestler at the time, but did everybody always know and believe that raw was Vince McMahon's number one priority? Because we've heard that forever, that there was even once upon a time where Vince only went to raw. He didn't go to SmackDown. Raw was the important one. Raw was the stress. Raw was the focus. Even when SmackDown was live, raw was the apple of Vince's eye. True or false? False. Uh, I think that you have to look at it in, in this vein. Again, going back to the live and tape. Vince had to focus on, on Raw, and Raw was first. Now, having been on SmackDown uh, back in the day and being the lead writer of SmackDown, what have you, you always felt. I, and I would even dare say there were times that Raw felt like they were the stepchild. But when Vince is working on something else, it's like, well, why didn't he give him me time? <laughs> Why aren't we talking about SmackDown? And the answer to that is simple. Vince is looking at what is in front of him and what's next. Next was always raw. So when you're, you're dealing throughout the week, he, the next one he has to tackle is going to be raw. Then right after raw, that's SmackDown. So I think SmackDown kind of got the feeling sometimes and, and me included that, Hey man, we're, we're second class citizens and, and, uh, we're not going to get any of his attention until Ross through. That was the case. I mean, that was just reality in that he was dealing with what was next. Raw was live. Raw was up next. That's what he was focusing on the time. Now he's going to look at SmackDown and he's going to give it just as much attention. And then he doubles that double downs on Tuesday to where <laughs> it's like, okay, it's pedal to the metal on SmackDown. What are we doing guys? Let's, let's make this the best it can be. And he doesn't give a shit about raw at that point, but the perception of people, I think throughout the years has always been, you know, raw's the baby raw was first raw, but by virtue of raw being live, I think really gave people the the feeling of oh it's number one it's the a show it's the only one they care about you know we uh we talked a little bit ago about when some of the boys found out about the draft and and they would be moving shows and you said that you know they he wanted to play it he being vance pronouns pal wanted to play it close to the vest and and really wanted to keep it a secret and and two years prior to this, when you guys first did this shake up or draft, you told the wrestlers to go to the website to find out if they'd been shipped to a new brand and here they don't find out until they show up. And a lot of the raw wrestlers are communicating to the SmackDown wrestlers. Oh, Hey, by the way, this just happened. Um, and apparently, you know, I guess we sometimes as fans don't think about this, but uh, someone told Wade Keller guys can't even tell their wives when they're going to be home next said one wrestler. Um, you know, we're right off of WrestleMania. You guys usually do a big European tour. So that's obviously going to be affected. You've got your travel booked, but your travel is booked based on whether you're on raw or SmackDown. So all of a sudden, if that changes, uh, your entire, you know, work life could change on a whim. Would, how would you you know, categorize or classify or describe the locker room and, and this, the draft, this feels like the most unpopular thing that happens in the locker room. Do I have that wrong? Well, look, I think that a lot of it becomes paranoia. And here, here's why I say that guys can't tell their wives when they're going to be home. Well, you're on the same touring schedule. So if you're going to SmackDown, it means you're coming home on Wednesday, but you're not leaving until Friday. If you're on raw, then you're coming home on Tuesday and you're leaving on Thursday, same time at home, same, same schedule, same, everything international tours, they toured simultaneous. So how does that affect anything other than what town you're going to go to and perform in that night? I think that the, the paranoia and the angst came from just not knowing and not, not knowing where I'm going to be, what buddies I'm going to be with, what I'm going to be doing and, and things of that nature. And, and how's it going to affect my push, if you will. So that's where the angst came from. And that's where a lot of the confusion and, and feeling came from an emotion. But for the most part, 
nothing you know, it was not changing anything in their personal lives per se. Some it was better. Some was like, okay, hey, I, I would rather be home on Tuesday. And some would say, well, fuck, I'm glad I don't have to leave until Friday. Yeah, man. So I, I get it. That's, the, tra- the train goes on. And uh, yeah. it can be a little frustrating, especially if you're in a hurry or running late, to find yourself at a railway crossing waiting for a train. And if the signals are going and the train's not even there yet, you can feel a bit tempted to try and sneak across the tracks. Well, don't ever. Trains are often going faster than you expect them to be, and they can't stop. Even if the engineer hits the brakes right away, it can take a train over a mile to stop. By that time, what used to be your car could just be a crushed hunk of metal. And what used to be you, well, better not to think about that. The point is you can't know how quickly the train will arrive. The the train can't stop even if it sees you. And the result is disaster. If the signals are on, the train is on its way. And you just need to remember one thing. Stop. Trains can't. Ron Simmons jumped off the train and uh, he was released from the WWE <laughs> around this time. <laughs> it ended up resulting in the biggest push of Bradshaw's career after that. No, happened. start over, start over. No, no, we're good. What are your uh, memories of Ron's release and uh, how it was taken backstage? God, Ron, you know, was probably one of the most beloved individuals in the wrestling business. Um, legit badass, one of the greatest football players ever to put on a pair of pads. Great wrestler, uh, great guy, one of my favorite human beings in, in the world. And a good friend. It was, unfortunately, it was time to break up the APA. And I don't think that Ron was in a place where he was going to really excel as a single. And, and I don't know that Ron wanted to. So it was, unfortunately, time to to part ways with Ron. And it, it actually gave JBL the biggest opportunity of his life to go out and be a single and become JBL versus, you know, John Layfield or John Bradshaw from the APA. Uh, it sucked. It it was a hard thing to do. It was, it was really, really tough. I remember the night it happened and there were a lot of tears, but, but Ron also understood. I mean, he's Ron Simmons is a man's man. And, um, he, he took it like a man and hugged everybody, thanked everybody and went on. But it was just, it's still sad because you hate to see somebody like that go when you, you don't have anything. And he knew, I mean, he knew. Was he, was he not interested or not the right fit for like an agent type role? Cause we see a lot of guys transition from out of the ring into a backstage role, but Ron never did that. Ron wasn't interested in doing that. And I I don't think that, I also think that Ron was looking for a break from the road too. I think he was looking for not to be on the road, uh, with that kind of schedule, grueling schedule anymore. And I think he was, he was ready for a change. Well, somebody else who was ready for a change is Goldberg. He did a radio show in Edmonton around this time. And he referred to the company as soap opera and said, working there was ridiculous. And it felt like being in a circus. And he said he only had interest in wrestling in Japan. Uh, When you guys see that after bringing him in for a big contract and, you know, trying to work with him and, you know, didn't end the best way. What's the feedback when you read that he says it was a soap opera and ridiculous and felt like being in the circus and he'd rather just work Japan. Well, first of all, there's a soap opera and, uh, and that part is correct, but Bill was never happy when he was there the first run at all. And so it, it was kind of expected. I think Bill was saying things like that before he came to work for the company and he was saying things like that while he was in the company. So it wasn't a big shock. It was just, oh, there's Goldberg again. So let's talk about Brock Lesnar. And we talked about Goldberg leaving and, and Brock Lesnar had his last match at WrestleMania 20 as well. You can hear about that in the archives. Of course, something to wrestle.com. 
Wade Keller would report that, uh, Brock did an interview in Minnesota with Mike Morris on K fan radio. And he said that his dream had always been to play for the Minnesota Vikings. And he left the WWE because he didn't want to be 40 years old, wondering what could have been. And he left the door open saying, I'm not saying I may never go back there, but I'm walking away from the wrestling business for now. And he advised that people could go online and read why he had been unhappy. And he confirmed the torch reports that he told Vince McMahon of his unhappiness with the schedule demand six months prior and that he planned to quit two weeks prior to WrestleMania and then confirmed that decision just one week later. And he almost made it sound like he was closing that chapter of his life, but he stressed how much he wanted to spend time with his daughter and how he had begun intense training to try out for the Minnesota Vikings. When you guys hear you know, the news that, Hey, he really is moving forward with this football dream. Was it met with a lot of skepticism in the office? I don't know if it's skepticism, skepticism. It was okay. How long, how long will that last? Right. When you you have a machine like that, Brock Lesnar is still is, you know, a very unique animal. And what he did best was wrestle. That's what he had never played football. So it, it was kind of shocking, but at the same time, he's the kind of athlete. <laughs> if he puts his mind to it, he's going to do everything that he has to do to make it come to fruition. So there were people that said, God, I wish he would do what he does best wrestle. But there were also those that knew him. that were like, he's putting his mind to it. He's going to do every fucking thing he can to make this thing a reality or get his ass kicked doing it. And Brock was bound and determined he was going to make it work. And he was, he was going to find out one way or another, whether or not he could play football. And that was a dream he had. It was something he wanted to try and he did it, you know, and he went out and, and did it. But I think there were, there were those of us that, and I'll say for me included that I wanted it back. I, I, (laughs) I wanted him on the roster. I didn't want him playing football or doing something else. So um, I was skeptical because he, he had never he had never really played football. And the odds of being able to walk on and make that a reality are very slim. But he was able to do it and prove everybody wrong. Steve Austin also left the company at the end of April. Uh, Wade Keller would report Steve Austin is a free agent five years ago. Those words would have reverberated across the wrestling industry worldwide and threatened to shift the balance of power towards the highest bidder today. It's barely a headline story due to Austin's health and his lack of options in wrestling outside of WWE negotiations reached a break point last week, leading to WWE posting a statement on their website, WWE and Steve Austin part ways. It was followed by a standard pithy statement saying they were unable to come to terms on a new agreement and mutually agreed to part ways. And it was said both parties are open to negotiations in the future. And then WWE wished him luck. Sources said the negotiations came down to a simple yet unresolvable difference. Austin's desire to gain the use of the stone cold moniker for non WWE projects and WWE's unwillingness to transfer such rights. Austin had become eager to test his marketability on projects without being beholden to the WWE schedule of weekly appearances on raw. And although there have been widespread reports of ill will between Austin and Vince McMahon during the negotiations, sources say that wasn't the case. Although Austin hired a lawyer to negotiate for him in the end, it was a mutual decision between both Austin and McMahon to part ways for now on reasonably good terms, although not without frustration on both sides. Austin will be forced to try to make a go of his post WWE career without the use of the stone cold moniker that his then wife Jeannie came up with in 1996. Chat me up here. What do you remember about Steve Austin? Not coming to terms to come back. It does feel like the end of an era, you know, somebody who is arguably the biggest star in the history of the company and made the company the most money. And now he wants to try his hand somewhere else. And allegedly the sticking point is this stone cold moniker. What do you remember about him leaving here and this particular stone cold piece of business? Well, I wasn't involved in, in the official negotiations. And from my recollection, for the most part, it was, 
it's time to renew. It's time to do a new contract. And while Steve was unable to be Stone Cold Steve Austin from the Attitude Era, there was still a place for Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, on the roster and to be a part of WWE. And I think that it's tough when you're put in a position that, hey, I, I can't be what I used to be, but I still want to make the same money. And I still want to have the same things afforded to me, and, and I want to do other things. It's, it's you want your cake and eat it too. So I, I don't know. That's just my feeling. I don't know if that's the case because Vince really wanted to keep Steve, and Vince really wanted Steve to stay with the company. And I think Steve really wanted to stay with the company too. And a lot of times in situations like that, guys will hire agents or they'll hire lawyers. It removes them from the process. So it doesn't become personal. And that's a tough thing to do. Um, in this case, that's what Steve did. And they were unable to come to an agreement. It, it's as simple as that, that, you know, Vince want, he wants his IP that he made famous and that he, you know, put on the map. Um, Steve wanted to do other things, still wanted to do stuff with the WWE, but, but wanted to be able to freely go out and do other stuff as well. Um, and I think Vince was like, okay, if I'm going to invest, then I need to reap the rewards of that investment. And guys forget that sometimes that it's, you know, Vince, Vince made it happen. It's, it's his, it's his vehicle that brings them to the spot. He wants to, you know, continue to reap those rewards because he's the one to put in the initial investment. It just boiled down to, um, can't come to terms right now. And if you want to go out and pursue other interests and you want to pursue movies, you want to pursue television shows, whatever else you want to do, good luck. And we'll help you where we can. But, um, Sometimes you just gotta you gotta move on, and that's where it's kind of where it felt this time that they just couldn't agree on this what we're gonna do this amount of money and here's a storyline going forward. Well, Vince didn't have a storyline going forward because he didn't have a commitment to say yes, I'm gonna stay in and do this, and. Steve really wanted to, to try other things. So sometimes that's best. It's best for everybody for, for some, for a talent to go away. You realize how much you either needed them, you know, wanted them, or maybe you didn't, maybe you were getting along fine without them. And for a talent, sometimes it's best to go out and see that sometimes the real world isn't as kind as it is when you're within the company. And maybe sometimes there's a lot more opportunity out there for you. So it's, it's, there's a lot of different sides to that coin. And with this one, it just came down to, we can't make an agreement right now. Best of luck. We'll see you down the road. It, it wasn't any animosity here at all. All right, Bruce, let's run a time out right now to remind everybody that this sponsor has been with us from day one. And that's why we love them so much. And we hope you will support them as well. We're talking about our friends at manscaped. Did you know that one man every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? In fact, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer amongst men that are aged 15 to 35. With April being National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, our friends at Manscaped have partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to help spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. Visit manscaped.com forward slash TCS to learn how to check yourself for early signs of cancer and as always, you can use our promo code STW. You'll get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. You know, I really love that manscaped wants us to talk just a second about men's health issues that are important to me and well, all of us. And I think all of us listening to this have had some form of cancer touch our life. Uh, not even talking about, you know, our extended family. My dad had prostate cancer more than a decade ago. And it's a scary proposition, man. And with this in mind, I want you to know when it comes to testicular cancer, you can still perform simple routine self-checks at home while enjoying Manscaped products. <laughs> Same ones you use every day, 
like the lawnmower 5.0 ultra and that makes sense right we use these products daily to trim and maintain our boys down there well check out the lawnmower 5.0 ultra it has two interchangeable skin safe blade heads a standard one for a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth and sleek with dual led spotlights you'll have better visibility and that'll make the trimming more precise and even more hassle-free hey i want to give you a pro tip here too you don't have to worry about making a mess this dude is waterproof so you can shave in the shower the bath hell do it in the ocean bring it wherever you go too. there's a great travel lock feature and it's got wireless charging now in addition to providing you with the right tools and solutions for comfortable and easy grooming manscaped is committed to raising awareness and giving support for fighters survivors and families that have all been impacted by testicular cancer. That's why they're going to be donating $50,000 to the testicular cancer society. Help them save lives and balls by going over to manscaped.com slash TCS and sharing their funny, but educational check yourself video. And while you're at it, don't forget, grab 20% off plus free shipping with the code STW because like a famous American philosopher once said, take care of your mentals your balls and your chickens. You know, we've talked a lot about how Austin was so, uh, hands-on with his character when he was in ring and he would get, you know, very particular about the way his character was presented and he would be very vocal, but he wasn't happy about something here. He had really just been doing like raw sheriff skits. You know, he's not nearly as important of a part of the program and the creative, I could see how he would say was not really his cup of tea. How big of a, how big of a part of this was him saying, you know what? I'd rather people just remember me being the badass stone cold stunning everybody and drinking beer and raising hell instead of doing some of this GM raw sheriff stuff. I think that that was played a part in it. Definitely. Um, but Steve couldn't work. These health issues prevented him from being in the ring every night, preventing him from working. And the raw sheriff stuff was that was Steve's idea. So to be able to to continue to do that stuff and make Steve the focal point when you can't realize a return on that investment in house shows or pay per views or anything like that, your biggest star is a guy that can't get in the ring and compete. That from a company standpoint, that's hard to do now to have that character in there, but, and do that, that's great, but what's that worth? So that is, again, that, that is the argument there for Steve. If he wants to go out on top and go out with people remembering him, I did, I, I don't begrudge that at all. I think that that's the way that people should go out, quite frankly, is, is go out on top on your terms and, and move on. What's the reaction in the locker room when Steve Austin leaves? Next. Let's keep it moving here. Let's you talk. know, really, but I mean, no, I mean, really it was, it was, it was next more than anything. It's like, okay, Steve's gone. Who's, uh, who is there for that next spot? And there wasn't a whole lot of, because he wasn't involved in, in any programs or anything like that. It was, he was a character and people just looked at it as okay. More opportunity for me. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a major shift backstage. Wade Keller would report the long overworked Jim Ross has been promoted to executive vice president business strategies. According to WWE, he will now work closely with Vince McMahon as an advisor on WWE's core business. John Laurinaitis, AKA Johnny Ace, formerly of the dynamic dudes tag team in the United States with Shane Douglas has assumed Ross's duties as vice president of talent relations. Laurinaitis has been working as Ross's assistant in that area for a long time. And many suspected Laurinaitis would take over for Ross eventually in that position. Laurinaitis will now be the point man in management when wrestlers need to ask for a day off, update their injury status, have travel concerns, or want to ask about their latest paycheck. Perhaps more significantly, he replaces Raw, Ross rather, as the main person in charge of house show lineups and match finishes, areas he had already been exerting influence over. Ross, of course, remains an announcer on Raw, and before the April 12th Raw, Vince McMahon announced the change to the wrestlers. Jim Ross then gave a heartfelt speech for about 10 minutes 
about how much working with the wrestlers has meant to him, how everyone has a family like feel to him and how he'll still be around. And then he introduced Laurinaitis as his replacement, who also gave a brief speech, uh, where most everyone was already quite familiar with him already. And Laurinaitis was originally in charge of the former WCW wrestlers whose contracts were acquired as part of the buyout from Tom Warner. And the idea was at the time for the brands to be separate and for Laurinaitis to be the main person in charge of all those WCW brand talents anyway. But of course, since that phased out, he wound up working with talent, uh, but underneath Jim Ross, shut me up. Uh, how did you think that this would be handled? Was this handled the right way? Were you in favor of this switch? Uh, was it just time for Jr. to sort of get out of the race car there? I mean, it does feel like a, a pretty, uh, tireless job at times. Talent relations is the absolute most thankless job in the business. Um, that and creative, uh, <laughs> but it, it just, you're, you're the bad guy giving all the bad news. Very seldom do you really get to give any good news, but it's, it's constantly, it becomes a managing of issues and problems. Jim Ross was probably one of the best that ever sat in that chair and Jim was excellent at it, did very well. But I think Jim was Jim was getting tired too of dealing with all the day to day bullshit that came with it. Uh, Laurenitis had come in, and Laurenitis younger, and <laughs> he he wanted it, you know. Um, as much as I like to make fun of John and and what have you, John did a great job. Anybody that is in that role and that can stay for longer than two weeks, hats off to him (laughs) because it's thankless. It's tireless. It never ends. You are on call, uh, 48 hours a day. That's right. Not 24 hours, 48 hours every day. Um, because you got twice as much shit on you. So for Jr. to get out of that and be able to kind of oversee and, and do some other things, I think was refreshing for Jim to try and get his creative juices going a little bit more on the business side of things, which Jim liked as well. Um, put Lauren Itis there. I think it was the only pick that they had at the time. And it was a good one. John stepped into it and, did the job, no matter who's in that job, they are the most unpopular person in the world in the locker room with the talent. Doesn't matter. What do you think his speech sounded like? I mean, how do you remember it? JR's or John's John's guys. I just want to thank you. And, uh, in case you didn't notice, uh, Vince worked buys today. Good God. They're fucking huge. Uh, my job to oil them, so don't anybody get excited because I'm already there. By the way, boss, you're fucking vascular as hell. Something like that. Uh, let's get to backlash. Uh, Shelton Benjamin is going to be in the opening match here with the Nature Boy Ric Flair, and uh, they're going to go nine minutes and thirty-one seconds. Wade would say it's a chop fest with Flair getting a big dose of cheers from the crowd. In the end, as Flair turned his back and pulled out a foreign object, Benjamin splashed him from behind and then clotheslined him and scored the pin. Neither Flair's age nor Benjamin's inexperience left either seeming out of place. Both could be happy with their performances. Two and a quarter stars. I thought it was a good match. Great opening match for the pay-per-view. Wade liked it too, but he only gave it two and a quarter stars. You saw it this week for the first time in 15 years. What did you think? Well, I, I just look at it and I'm always amazed by how Ric Flair could go. And Rick, uh, I think people thought Rick was 100 years old, you know, 30 years ago. And he moved like a cat. And to see Rick, and Rick was hanging with, you know, a young guy like Shelton Benjamin from Minnesota, Rick from Minnesota. I think that Rick. That's where he excelled. He loved working with amateurs. People forget what an incredible athlete Ric Flair was before he even became a wrestler. <laughs> he was a football player. He was trained by Vern Gagne. All this shit. And yes, people think he's the greatest in the world, but I think that they take it for granted sometimes at how good he was at making other talent and really making people special. And this is a great case and a great display 
with Shelton Benjamin. Shelton's great. Shelton's awesome. Um, but Ric Flair made him look like he belonged in the ring with the top guys in the world. Uh, next up, uh, or I guess we should mention a few weeks prior to this, Shelton had pinned triple H clean on raw and here he pins Ric Flair. Of course, Rick is at the time here, one half of the tag team champions with Batista evolution is still running roughshod. So you guys are obviously feeling like you're going to, you know, have some upside with Shelton Benjamin getting a win over triple H now getting a win over Ric Flair, but he doesn't really wrestle a lot of singles matches when he's on SmackDown and he's a part of the world's greatest tag team with Charlie Haas. And you wind up not really strapping the rocket to him. Even after he beat triple H, even after he beat Ric Flair, what was it that kept Shelton Benjamin from really getting a full vote of confidence from the company's creative? I think more than anything, it was the ability to connect with the audience verbally. And Shelton's one of those guys, one of the most entertaining people in the back. However, he tries to become a character when it's time to speak in the ring. Very few guys that can touch Shelton Benjamin with his in ring work, but there was just a disconnect in my opinion with the audience that kept him from ever getting over to the next level. Um, watch him work. I can watch him work all day long. He's, he's amazing. And one of the toughest some bitches in the, <laughs> you know, on the roster, people forget that too. Um, but there's just that it, that, that connection factor to me was the one thing that kind of just held him back at that point. You could, you could get so far and then it just kind of stalled out. Shelton Benjamin, one of my, uh, low key favorites from back in the day. And I kind of hoped he would have, uh, had a bigger run on top and maybe had a shot at the title headline, some pay-per-views, but it wasn't to be, but. He had some pretty memorable moments on the show over the years. You know, that super kick with Shawn Michaels is still something that they show on replay every now and again, just a phenomenal underrated performer. Maybe he doesn't get his just due. Uh, let's talk about Todd Grisham, man. We haven't talked about Grisham a ton here on the show, but we see him here interviewing Randy Orton and Orton says, you know, he's the longest reigning IC champ in seven years, and he's going to earn the respect of Foley tonight. But he also says he's going to retire Foley because he's not scared of him and he's going to treat him like the old, sad, toothless dog he is. And he's going to put him out of his misery tonight. And they're of course, talking about a hardcore match later in the show with him and Foley, uh, for the intercontinental title, pretty good program for Randy Orton. One that certainly got my attention, but before we talk about that, and it's not time to talk about the match yet, let's talk about Todd Grisham, a name. We don't talk about a ton here on the show. You know, I don't even know where the hell Grisham came from. And he's he's doing uh, soccer. He's doing a lot of different things right now. He's with ESPN, right? Yeah. But, no, wait, no, I don't uh, think he is anymore. I think he maybe has just left there. I could be wrong. Yeah, but he, I thought that Todd Grisham was, when you're talking about people underrated like Shelton Benjamin, Todd was another one that was underrated. And Todd was a great play-by-play guy. And also doing interviews, what have you, but he was kind of nondescript, but just very, which is good for an interviewer, but he had a tremendous wit and was very, very good. He was a student of the game, did his homework and always came prepared and was ready to go on a moment's notice. Was one of those talent that you never had a problem going live with that, you had confidence in, and I was so happy for Todd when Todd got got the gig. He, he loved soccer and to be able to, to move on and expand his career. And every once in a while, I, I will speak to him on Twitter or what have you and just kind of go back and forth. But that's one of those success stories you look at that has gone on beyond the WWE and made a name for himself and is a damn good commentator. I think these days he's uh, doing stuff with glory and UFC. Uh, he wrapped it up with, um, ESPN in 2016, but you know, maybe one of the more, uh, I don't know, underrated performers on the show. It feels like, you know, Michael Cole's been there forever, but the Todd Pett and Gold, Todd Pett and Gills and, the uh, the Todd Grishams, they've sort of come and gone, but I always thought Todd did a pretty good job here. What'd you think of this promo with Randy Orton? I love the program with McFoley. I felt like it added 
a level of badassery. That's not a word, but I just made it up for uh, Randy Orton. And uh, I dug it. What did you think of this promo in particular, though? Well, it's just how young Randy was. This <laughs> is like, holy shit. Um, and you still, when you compare it to today, you look at Randy and go, ah, oh, God damn, he was still green. But he still had that air of confidence and that air of cockiness that has made Randy's entire career. And that is, it's a self-assuredness that even then he had. You take every, you strip him down, everything else. He still had that air of confidence and, and just, okay, I can go with anybody. And he believes it because he can. Next up, we've got an interesting matchup. I can't believe this is real. Jonathan Coachman pins to Jerry in six minutes and 22 seconds. That's right. Coach, a fucking commentator, beat to Jerry, an active wrestler. Now, he did have some help from the outside. Garrison Cade. Uh, manages to knock out to Jerry that allows coach to schoolboy him, but still coach in a, in a match on pay-per-view against the Jerry Bruce who booked this shit. Are you upset? It wasn't in the main event. My God. Or, well, I mean, what, what's next? We got know, super crazy his, and Michael Cole. Yeah, actually. Um, you know, coach was never, ever. <laughs> Coach wasn't a wrestler. Coach didn't want to wrestle, but he kept getting himself into these situations where it was like people wanted to see Coach get his ass kicked. And it came, it can go all the way back to his interviews with The Rock and some of those different things where Coach was so good and had just exudes personality that when he would sometimes say shit, people go, ah, fuck him, man. And he had heat. Coach had heat, legitimate fucking heat that was hard to get on heels back in that, that day and time. But he was able to do it where people really wanted to see him get his ass kicked. He trained. He busted his ass. He, he learned what he could learn. He would get to the buildings early and get in the ring and learn what he could learn to get through matches. Um, to his credit, he was an athlete, and he was able to, to pull it off. But he was a character. He was a character that was on TV every week. People could relate to him, and they hated his guts. So um, Vince just kept putting him in situations where you want to see him get his ass kicked. And then at the right time, you know, let him get some heat. Let him let him beat somebody where he shouldn't. He shouldn't beat to Jerry. Shouldn't be in the ring. But not only is he in the ring, he actually comes out the victor. And that's where the heat came from. And, and I... I, I love coach, uh, especially heel coach in this day and time because no one would call it and people were pissed off. You shouldn't do it, but they would sit there and tune in to watch him get his ass kicked. It's like the guy that says, I don't watch wrestling anymore. I, I stopped watching that 10 minutes ago. But by God, the other night when that Seth Rollins, and it was like, thought you didn't watch. Well, I saw that. That's what coach brought out in people. He shouldn't be on there. He shouldn't do it. that son of a bitch. Talk to me. Heat. How did Tajiri handle this? Was Tajiri, uh, all right. I mean, is this something, was he have a reputation for bucking creative or was he cool mode day? <laughs> Tajiri son. Uh, Jesus Christ. I don't think he ever heard a crossword or a disagreement from Tajiri ever. Tajiri was happy to do whatever, whenever. And he's a pros pro and loved the opportunity. If he could go out and perform, get somebody over, that's what he did. He, to Jerry does not have an ego and was happy to go out and do it. Just be a part of the show and be involved in a storyline. Let's talk a little bit about one of the sad stories in wrestling. Uh, he's involved in this. It's Garrison Cade. Uh, he was born, um, or I guess he wrestled under Lance Cade. He was born Lance Curtis McNaught and he performed under Lance Cade or Garrison Cade, either one trained by Shawn Michaels. We lost him in 2010. Uh, he had a run with you guys with, with Trevor Murdoch and, and did, did okay there. Uh, but he spent some time, you know, in all the, the critical developmentals, whether it was Ohio Valley or heartland wrestling. And as I said, trained by Sean, but then he winds up getting released. And then unfortunately, uh, at the age of 29, he died in 2010 of, of an apparent heart failure. Uh, his wife said he hadn't been looking well in the week prior to his death. And he went to the hospital 
on that same, uh, a few days ahead of time with difficulty breathing, but discharged himself the next day. And, um, two months after he passed away, a staffer in San Antonio said that he had accidentally died from mixed drug intoxication, complicating cardiomyopathy. So a fucking sad story, uh, but one all too familiar to wrestling at times. I always thought that this guy had the right look. Like if you were to sort of sketch out in your sketchbook, you know, what a wrestler would look like, you might come up with something that looked like Garrison or Lance Cade. And for whatever reason, he never really, um, hit maybe the success that he hoped he would. Uh, what can you tell us about Garrison Cade? I don't know when we'll talk about him again. I think that Garrison's issue was he was playing wrestler and Garrison was trying to play a part rather than be the part. So I will never forget the first time I laid eyes on him was in Shawn Michaels school in San Antonio. And we were standing there watching him work out and I looked at Sean. And he says, I know who's the big guy. And I said, yeah. And he, he started telling me about Lance and he says, well, the ones you need to watch are spanky, which is, um, Oh Brian, my God, Brian, Brian, Kendrick. Brian Kendrick. Jesus. I went blank for a minute. Uh, he goes, you need to watch spanky. You need to, uh, check out shooter. His name was shooter Schultz. And then, uh, he goes, man, he goes, Brian Danielson. He goes, this kid, he goes, he and spanky, came here from Washington and goes, those are the studs of the whole class. Um, he says, Brian or Spanky, he works out every single class and Brian Danielson that they're here for every class, beginner advanced, they do everything. He said, I know you want Garrison or Lance. And I said, yeah, I said, but you know, we'll look at the other ones. And I hired all four, uh, to go into developmental way back when. And I never, you know, it, for Lance, it was a situation where he was trying to play a part and I'll, I'll liken it to Shelton in that he never really connected with the audience because he was never able to get his genuine personality. He was very quiet, very shy guy in real life. So he had to get into some kind of a character to get anything out of him. But then he would overanalyze everything and, and try to think of – he's like, for example, I created something for him and, and tried to get him to do it. And he would say, well, I don't know that I would do that. And I said, motherfucker, you didn't mean – this isn't your deal. Trust me. Yes, this character <laughs> would do this. Um, he would overanalyze and, and second-guess a lot of things, but he just never really connected with the audience. Had all the gifts – he was great in the ring. He had the look that looked like he should be the champion. Great look. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the head was just not all there and that he, he just tried to overanalyze and, and figure things out that didn't need to be figured out. Instead, it's just sometimes it's a feel. I always best lesson I ever give people in when they're coming through the ranks is – well, I was thinking this. I said, okay, great. Stop that. Stop thinking and just feel. And that will lead you in the right direction if you just feel something versus think about it. All right, Bruce, let's take a time out right now. This will be our last one. But we want to tell everybody about the amazingkind.com. Man, you've uh, you've been put through the ringer over the last year. And no matter what was going on, you could always look to the amazingkind.com. Could you not? Absolutely, because it's a natural way to take care of your aches and your pains and just genuinely make you feel better. And it's all natural and it's all good for you. The amazing kind is a plant-based pain relief balm, creams and gels, everything you need for your muscles and joints. And how about this? Even some infused oils for mood support and sleep. And it's all available at the amazing kind.com. And when you go to the amazing kind.com, you can get 20% off your entire order and it's easy because the promo code is wrestle. I'm telling you, your body will thank you. You're going to love when you start working with amazing kind, you're going to realize and learn it's a family run business specializing in plant-based plant-based palm relief or pain relief balms. Really think about that. Like when we're not sure what we're putting in our body or what's going on our body, knowing that something's plant-based, it just makes me feel better. 
And not only that, we know for sure that these products have been sourced for the highest quality because they're using GMPC certified manufacturers. They're testing for quality and purity. You're going to get exactly what it says on the label. There's no junk here. Not only that, this guy, the fo the founder here of the amazing kind.com, he's one of us. He's a big wrestling fan. He used to work in the wrestling business. He was a producer and editor for the WWE worked on their commercials and marketing. I'm just saying this guy, he knows a thing or two about what we like and what we need and what these athletes are putting themselves through on the road for WWE. They've got these uh, topical CBD products that can really help after sports or workouts or physical activity to help with some muscle recovery. It can help you with your, your sore muscles or your stiff joints, your back aches, your arthritis. Maybe you're just spending a long day on your feet. What well, can help you with that too? But the infused oils, man, if you're having trouble sleeping, I just can't recommend this enough. What you'll find is the amazing kind can hook you up with CBD or CBG or CBN. But dude, when it comes to the infused oils for the helping you fall asleep and then stay asleep and have that more restful sleep, if you've been struggling with things like insomnia or waking up or tossing and turning, I just cannot recommend this enough. Try it right now. It's at the amazing kind.com. You can see the infused oils can have 500 milligrams to 5,000 CBD oils. How about that? Think about that. 500 to 5,000 milligrams. You're going to have the best rest you ever did. Check it out right now. The amazing kind.com. Be sure to use our promo code wrestle and you'll get 20% off your entire order. And I'd like you to keep this slide up here because I'm going to give you all a pro tip. Okay. You take a look at the pain relief bottle right there. Okay. Wonderful to put on sometimes we all warm up before we work out and you should this helps you you may feel stiff and just this is going to help relax the muscles a little bit will help warm them up put that on before your workout before your physical therapy and it's going to work wonders then you work out pretty much pain free when you're done man your muscles are tight you probably think big, big bag of ice would do great Take right next door. Look right next door at CBD Freeze. You rub that on the affected areas where you're feeling a little sore, where you might normally put a bag of ice, and you can even put it in places where a bag of ice isn't going to go, and it's going to do the same thing and make you feel great. So I'm just speaking from experience. I use this. I love it, and uh, you will too. Check it out, theamazingkind.com, and use our promo code Russell. Let's keep it moving here and let's talk about Chris Jericho. He's going to get a win over Christian and Trish. It's a handicap match. Uh, of course, Jericho and Christian do the majority of the match together. Trish gets knocked off of the apron pretty hard early on in the match. And she tags in when Jericho's down, but never for long. The crowd is chanting slut loudly at one point, which I don't think you could do today. Uh, Jericho put the walls of Jericho on Trish very briefly, about 10 and a half minutes in, but Christian breaks it up. And then Jericho catapults Christian into Trish, then hits an enziguri and nails the three count. Uh, Wade Keller would say solid action, which fit the storyline. Nice match two and three quarter stars. They go 11 minutes and 17 seconds here. And I guess we should mention, this is really a continuation of the storyline, uh, that sort of culminated or had a major twist at WrestleMania 20. Uh, where Trish would turn on Jericho at WrestleMania and instead go with Christian, but the Christian and Trish pairing doesn't last too long after this. Uh, but Trish would continue to be the, the top heel in the company for, I guess, another year or so. What'd you think of the match? And why didn't we see more of Christian and Trish coming out of this? Well, I thought the match was great. It's two guys that love to work with one another. So it showed here and, uh, busted their ass. Nice little story. But Christian and, and Trish, Christian wasn't into it from the standpoint of the, the relationship with Trish and that kind of feel. Um, they did everything they could, but if they if their heart wasn't in it, it wasn't going to work and it wasn't going to get over to any extent. So just kind of you know cut bait, moved on with with Trish as a heel and and Christian in another direction. But this was just a case of chemistry and. If talent believes in something and they're ready, you know, they're really into the gimmick and they're really into the storyline, it's going to succeed. If they're not, you, you've got to do something different and change. 
let's keep it moving here. Let's talk about uh, a skit we see with Eugene walking in on Gail Kim dressing. She's going to scream and he screams back. Molly walks in. She screamed. Eugene screams back. William Regal entered and then he gets distracted by Gail Kim's breast. This is pretty funny. I love the segment. I know that uh, the Eugene character is something we'll spend more time on later. But whenever the ladies would scream and he would scream back, man, that was fucking funny stuff. <laughs> That's great stuff. Yeah, it was. We wanted Regal to come in and do the do the scream too, but I think that Regal's reaction more than anything, it, again, uh, another guy who doesn't get enough credit for his facials and his cell. Just enough, not over the top, just enough to where you get it and you fucking pop. And this was a great example of that. And everybody playing along. It was some good shit. Next up, and this is kind of weird. Uh, there is a video package talking about how today in Edmonton was Chris Benoit day. And this aired on heat and they have comments from his family and they show him going back to his old high school. They show the WrestleMania moment where he's hugging his parents and his wife, Nancy and his kids, and they show the mayor announcing Chris Benoit day he does a speech and he's tearing up as he's talking and the mayor of Edmonton wishes him luck. And Benoit says he's proud to be from right here in Edmonton. And then they show Benoit arriving earlier tonight on heat, wearing a suit and the belt on his shoulder, everyone around him clapping and at ringside, they get a shot of his wife and kids and parents and the rest of his family. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a nice story at the time. But in hindsight now, man, this is fucking hard to watch. Is it not brutal? Yeah. Brutal. Just sad. No other word to describe it. Just sad. Victoria is going to pin Lita in seven and a half minutes here to retain the WWE women's title. Uh, Keller would say what you'd expect some mistimed moves, but a spirited effort overall, Kim and Molly attacked Victoria and Lita afterwards. I guess we should mention that Lita got this match by winning a battle Royal to determine the number one contender on the April 5th raw. Uh, but I want to talk about Victoria. She's not somebody we've spent a lot of time talking about here on the show. Uh, she's, you know, come in several years prior to this as one of Godfather's hoes. And now she's the woman's champion. Uh, you talk about somebody overachieving here. Uh, any stories about her you'd like to share? Uh, I don't know when we'll talk about her again. Yeah, you know, Lisa Marone came to us from, of all people, Tori Wilson. Tori had done modeling, and Lisa was a fitness model out in California, looking to looking to do something else and do something different. And Tori thought that she would be great for the wrestling business. Gave me her information, her card, and I called her. Said that uh, is this something you would be interested in? Maybe we could train you. She immediately went out and found someone to train her. Uh, she just started calling people. Uh, hey, who do you know? And she went to Rick Bassman's UPW out in California and we hired her. We, we sent her, we had her stay there for a little while and train because we were using her for the, the host stuff. And she was one of those that trained on the go. So is we brought her and we sent her to different developmental territories but you talk about somebody that had drive and determination. Jesus Christ. Uh, Lisa just did whatever she could and went wherever she could to learn. And every day she would be in the ring early trying to learn something new because she – I don't think that the rest of the female talent knew how inexperienced she really was. And she was able to go in there and hang with them, and she would get in and – work with Molly, for example, uh, who was a great trainer and an amazing technician, but Lisa fucking fought her ass off, man. And she got out there and, and became somebody and became a name and became a champion, but that's all due to her hard work. Well, the hard work going into this next match is incredible. Uh, if you don't watch anything else this week in wrestling, I'm going to encourage you to stop what you're doing. And go fire up Backlash 2004 and watch Randy Orton and Cactus Jack create some magic for 23 minutes and five seconds. One of the more underrated matches of 2004. I absolutely love this match. Uh, we're going to see Randy Orton get the pin over Cactus. Uh, he's going to retain the Intercontinental title in the process. Wade Keller would say Foley used trash cans and the barbed wire baseball bat early against Orton. Orton fought back early and they brawled up the ramp. Foley laid the barbed wire baseball bat on Orton's crotch and then leg dropped it, drawing a huge pop. 
then Foley poured gas on the barbed wire bat, but Eric Bischoff threatened to shut the show down. If Foley lit it, Foley shifted to a huge mattress size board with barbed wire all over it. And then Foley poured thumbtacks all over the mat and he slammed Orton onto him. Orton sat up with tacks all over his back and fled to the back. Foley chased him down and threw him off the stage onto a platform of boards. And then Foley threw an elbow off the stage in the big spot of the match. Orton kicked out of the pin attempt back in the ring. Orton made a Superman come back and hit Foley with the bat. And then Foley returned fire with Mr. Sacco. Orton escaped with a low blow and then hit his RKO finisher onto the barbed wire bat for the finish. Four and a half stars. Man, the feud leading up to this was great, but the actual blow off, the payoff was something else, man. I, I didn't think I would see barbed wire bats. I didn't think I would see Randy Orton taking a bump into thumbtacks. This is crazy. Wade Keller loved it. He gave it four and a half stars. I did too. Uh, I was not the biggest Randy Orton fan before this. I don't know why I just never really connected to him, but on the heels of this, I was like, okay, I'm in, uh, talk to me about the match. And then I want to talk about the silliness of the thumbtack spot. I mean, holy cow, how does that slip through and how is that discussed with Vince and Randy? And it just feels like something that you wouldn't think would happen here, but it did. Well, I hated it from the standpoint of I hate the brutality of some of those matches. Um, and I, look, no, I I enjoyed the match and the story was excellent. The match was excellent. I cringe at the brutality of some of the stuff sometimes. I'm not a fan of barbed wire, not a fan of the baseball bat barbed wire thing, not a fan of thumbtacks and, and that kind of horse shit. But again, when it's done and the way that they did it, it made sense for the culmination of this whole storyline that had been going on for quite a while. And, and that credit for the storyline and, and everything going through all that credit goes to Mick Foley and Brian Gewertz, the way they worked together to, and it was Mick Foley that kept coming back. And what if we do this and we do that and Randy Orton being able to be, to be that guy, that conduit to make it all work. So, you know, hats off to them. It was a tremendous story and the kind of thing that Mick Foley does so well. It's you give Mick a long term deal and Mick is going to get the most that he can out of it. And you have a great worker like Randy Orton that can tell that story. Here's a young punk kid disrespecting the grizzled vet who's done everything under the sun to earn his reputation. And now Randy gets to experience all of the things that the grizzled vet experienced in an entire career in one match. That was the story. And that was the thing that really helped solidify Randy even more. So it was every step along the way with Randy Orton's story helped solidify him as this tremendous worker and talent that belonged in the position he was in. And I just thought it was one of the best stories ever told. And both guys played their part tremendously, but the brutality of those things, sometimes I just, I cringe watching them because I'm always afraid somebody's going to get seriously hurt, regardless of how well it's all thought out and, and how safe it may be. Um, I just cringe. Well, I, I did too, but you know, I don't know these guys as you know, I did back then. So. Uh, I was all about it. This was super fun. And I thought it was probably the biggest thing that Orton had done in his career, probably the biggest win of his career. I know he's the intercontinental champion, but Foley's been positioned, you know, as the world champ and a pay-per-view headliner and a WrestleMania headliner. And they started feuding where, you know, Orton's calling him out and calling him a coward. He even spit in his face, which I mean, I still remember very vividly. And there's so much of, of wrestling in this era. That's a blur, but that stands out. So then, you know, when they have a little interaction at the Royal rumble and that leads to a handicap tag match at WrestleMania and Orton pins Mick there, they're telling a really, really good story. And this is, is a great way to blow it off. Uh, and Randy Orton is only 24 years old at the time. Um, such a violent match, you know, his dad's obviously got a legacy in the business. Do you guys sit down and, and have a conversation with Randy about that? Is that something Foley would have presented or what do you think led uh, everybody getting on the same page with this? 
Mick had submitted the idea and Mick had talked about, you know, coming back and doing something. And, and it was Mick's idea originally. And then he got with, with Brian, who was a head writer of raw and they kind of laid it all out from beginning to end. And, and then, you know, a few things get added in between, but it was also to get to rock at WrestleMania and, and this whole thing with Randy. Um, but it was a great story and, and got with Randy who was happy and willing to do anything. And he loved working with Mick and got to that point where, yeah, we can tell this story. And it made sense. It was the young kid and that grizzled vet. And this was a passing of the torch with Mick. And Mick has so many torches he could pass, <laughs> you know, that he, he could do a whole nother story with another young up and comer. It's that's, the beauty of a character like Mick Foley and the human being as well, to be able to get this shit over. So everybody involved told a great story. Did this match make Randy Orton? I ask because, you know, it's not too terribly long after this and we're going to see Randy Orton win the world title and be, you know, the, one of the youngest to ever do so. Uh, I think he gets that win at SummerSlam. So it's not too terribly long after this. And I know the intercontinental title means something and he's been a part of evolution and there were big matches, but does this match help him stand out and cement him as a main event of events in your opinion? I think it did. I think because he was able to stand on his own and it wasn't, it wasn't an evolution deal or it wasn't a tag team. It wasn't other people involved. It was Randy on his own and he, he hung, he, he not only hung, he excelled. So yes. Without a doubt, this was that big first step to this guy's going to be a player for a long time. Let's show some replays, and then we go backstage and see Randy Orton there, and he's with Batista and Ric Flair. Triple H sees him and says he just became a legend tonight, and Todd Grisham is asking Hunter what he thinks his chances are in his match tonight. And Hunter says it would be sweet to beat Shawn Michaels, but beating Chris Benoit on Chris Benoit day would be huge. And no matter what the fans think of him, they shouldn't bet against him tonight. Uh, and then we get to, I guess what, uh, Wade Keller would describe as a deep breath match. Uh, Hurricane and Rosie, our superheroes would beat La resistance after interference from Eugene. At the time, Rosie is wearing a shirt that says superhero in training, which is abbreviated as S H I T. And, uh, those letters were often colored differently. This is, uh, this is fun. I, I was a big fan of Rosie. I was a big fan. Still am a big fan of hurricane. I liked superheroes in training. Uh, what did you think of, uh, of this pairing, the match and anything you can tell us uh, about Rosie? Cause I don't feel like we've talked about him a lot here on the show. Well, uh, I'd love the hurricane character and, and this probably did more for Rosie than any other character that, that he did, which is kind of crazy when you think about the legacy, because, uh, Matt, he was just Samoan lineage and seek a son, um, Roman Reigns brother. And it just, it, it, it's man, he loved it. He had fun and we had tried gangster stuff with him. We had tried bit, you know, the three minute warning stuff with him, all this different shit with him. And I don't think that anything resonated with the audience as much as him being paired with, with hurricane <laughs> and doing the superhero and training shit because it was fun. And you saw him having fun. He had big smile on his face. He would go out and he enjoyed it. So when the talent is enjoying something and the audience can really feel that they were, they were enjoying it as well. It was a let up. It wasn't going to be the main event at WrestleMania, but it was one of those characters that all the kids wanted to see and get their picture taken with. And everybody wanted to be a part of. So uh, to me, through everything that he did, I think that people will always remember him as, as Rosie, you know, superhero in training, which is, it's kind of strange considering the legacy and the family that he comes from. But at the same time, people, people remember him. And as far as, uh, the human being, 
couldn't have asked for a nicer, sweeter. You know, he looked like a big, mean, nasty monster. But he was one of the, the sweetest guys you ever want to meet in your life. Just, I mean, really loving. He was a, he was that kind of guy that, you remember when we did the kitten and saving the kitten and all that stuff? Yeah. That was him. That was the real person. <laughs> just the the gentle giant that loved everybody and and was got along with everybody and and I man when I I heard him passing that was one of those like oh man um, you never wish for someone else to be gone but that was one like ah, that's a big hole because he was just such a great great. Always had a smile on his face. Always, um, yeah, he was. It was always great to see him, and it, that character was so much fun, and probably closer to the real human being than anything. Let's talk about the next match. Uh, we've got Edge and Kane. They're going to work six and a half minutes. Edge gets the win when he uses his cast to knock out Kane. Otherwise, Kane dominated on offense. Uh, Wade would say it was a lumbering, methodical snoozer. He gave it three quarters of a star. I guess it's worth mentioning. This is Edge's first match back on television or pay-per-view in 14 months. He was sidelined after neck surgery. So it's a big win coming for him, uh, you know, after he uh, was sort of back around for the draft. Did you guys at this point have really high hopes for him or were, were you still trying to figure that out? I mean, he is late in the card here. So it does feel like you had some confidence in him, but where were you on his upside here in April of 2004? Oh my God. I, we were looking at edge to be a top guy and we were looking at edge to, to really break out. There were some naysayers and there were people that felt, ah, you know what? He's gone as far as he can go. And then there were those that said, let's give him the ball and see if he can run with it. I don't know. This was the greatest match in the whole wide world. But it was, I think that both guys were tentative from, and what I mean by that is it's Edge's first big pay-per-view back and, and Kane is in there and Kane wants to take care of him. Kane's more worried about him than he is himself. And you can just kind of feel it. it not, not the greatest match in the world, but as far as Edge goes, no nah, shit, man, we had big plans for Edge and looked at him to be one of those guys that steps up and is able to take it into the next level, you know, and he did. He definitely did. You know, he had been sort of stuck in the mid card for a long time, but you guys are going to strap the rocket to him. And speaking of rockets, let's get to our main event. Chris Benoit gets a win over Shawn Michaels and triple H when he makes Shawn Michaels submit in 30 minutes and 14 seconds. I, I put all that emphasis there because. At just as Bruce said at the top of the show, he beat Hunter with a submission move at WrestleMania 20. Now he's going to have Shawn Michaels submit just a month later. And uh, Wade loved it. He gave it four and three quarter stars. He says they nearly topped themselves, including a clever spot with Michaels putting Benoit in the sharpshooter with referee Earl Hebner in charge of the call. The crowd chanted, You screwed bread at Michaels, who played a subtle heel in the end after a lot of great spots and near falls and near submissions. Benoit put Michaels away with the sharpshooter. All three were equally fine in this match. It is a bit of a, a challenge. You know, you, you pull out all the stops for a big show like WrestleMania 20. You're in the main event. You're in Madison square garden. It's your job to, to make the new guy. You know, those guys work their ass off five-star performance. And now you're going to come back a month later and say, Hey, do it again. That's a lot of stress and pressure, is it not? Because you want to make it great, but you feel like it's got to be different too, right? Well, and it was different, but it's, if there was ever a bunch of talent that could do it, these guys could definitely do it. And the, the fact that Chris came out and he beat Sean, as we said in the very beginning of the, of the podcast, it made him whole, and I would have to say that this match was better than the WrestleMania match, and here's why. Because of the emotion involved of being in Chris's hometown. You had the emotion of Chris finally winning the championship at WrestleMania, but here, doing it in front of his hometown and, and everything, it it was another step for him, and 
I thought it was tremendous. Jesus, the match was absolutely incredible. Both of them were great. Uh, this one just had a little bit more emotion to it. Well, what'd you think? I mean, did you like this one better or the WrestleMania match better? I like this one better for that reason. I can't argue that as far as finishes go, it seems to be a good idea, you know, to, to sort of make him, as we said, you know, you beat Hunter before now you, you know, beat Sean here. Um, I like the tease of putting him in the, uh, the sharpshooter and Earl Hebner being in the match. Uh, whose idea was that? You know, it was probably just a spot they came up with and, and you're kind of 50, 50 is whether or not the audience is going to get it and they got it, but it was, you know, talent's just going through and come up with a spot and Hey, what about, what about this? And threw it in and they probably did it a lot, but in Canada, Hmm. With Sean, with Earl, they were there, man. They uh, they came for it. So it was one of those. Let's put it in. If it works to this extent, then great, we got them. If not, it's still a good spot just for the to get into the sharpshooter and do that. I guess we should mention the next night on Raw, Benoit and Edge would defeat Flair and Batista to win the tag team title. So Benoit becomes a double champion. Man, you talk about uh you know, pushing somebody, holy shit, Benoit double champion the night after he, he, you know, taps out Shawn Michaels in a three-way that's something else. Yep. And you know, that, that was a shift in where we were going. And like, if you're going to go with them, let's go with them and put everything that we can behind them. Well, here's some good news. The number of collisions involving a train at a railway crossing is down 83% from its peak in the 1970s. Now here's the bad news. There are still more than 2000 incidents a year. Stop. Trains can't. Uh, Let's get to uh, Twitter. We asked you guys on Twitter, if you had a question for this week's show, and if you'd like to ask a question for next week's show, which I can't believe it, we're going to do JBL. JBL won in a poll and it was not close. He ran away. Uh, He beat backlash 2008 and he beat King Kong Bundy uh, and he beat in your house, seven good friends, better enemies with Shawn Michaels and diesel on top. Are you surprised JBL won? I am. I am too. I, I, you know, with, with all the talk, with all the talk about Bundy lately and everything and everybody, you, it, it, we put the suggestions that everybody asked and we threw JBL in there I and he ran away with it. Crazy. I, yeah. I didn't, I mean, we've, we've had him on the poll a bunch before. I didn't think it would happen, but it did. And, uh, I'm sure our phones are going to blow up. After we record that saying that we were full of shit and it was all lies and he's going to demand equal time, which he won't get. So that'll be fun. Why don't we have him on as a guest? No. Why, why, would, why would we torture people with that? We don't want to do that. Right. With the, the goal. You're scared. Scared. The go- I'm scared. You're scared. What's he going to do? Give me a clothesline from hell. He could through the, from fucking Bermuda. I'm in Alabama. I ain't worried. I ain't worried uh, about that. He'll fly there. Okay. He might actually do that. All right. Let's get to the questions here about backlash 2004. Uh, We're going to do these rapid fire. Bruce, are you ready? I'm ready. Anderson wants to know why was the fire spot teased, but not used? Was it originally planned and then the venue shut it down or was it always designed to just get heat on Eric Bischoff? Yeah, it's a spot. It's a, just a spot in the match. It's, you don't have to do everything that you tease (laughs) that you're going to do. It's a spot in the match to change it up a little bit. Have fun. Did Foley want to use fire though? I mean, he's used fire before you guys have let him use fire. Did he want to do it here or was it always just designed for that? I believe it was just designed as as a spot here because he had done it before. So you think you're going to get it, but you don't, it gets taken away and that's just more heat. This is one of the reasons I enjoy shows like this. And I encourage people when they're voting to really keep this in mind. Like the title of this show is backlash show four, but we talked about so much other stuff. You got to think about what's going on around it because we're not just going to cover the pay-per-view as if it happened in a vacuum. We're going to cover, you know, the behind the scenes news and notes, roughly a 30 day period, give or take a few days of what's going on in the company. And, and Holden Smith knows that he asked, is this era the biggest turnover in top talent that Bruce ever experienced? Austin rock Lesnar and Goldberg are all out of here at this point rather quickly. Can Bruce think of another time in his career where the top talent turned over so much so quickly? 
I think during, yeah, during the the 90s when guys were going to WCW, there was a lot of top turnover. When you take Diesel and uh, Razor Ramon off right off the top, and then there were, were more following that and had been more. So, yeah, we'd experienced it before, and we'll experience it again. That's for sure. So you just have to adapt and roll with the flow. King of Kings writes, I thought Benjamin versus Flair was a great match. Why didn't Benjamin ever make it to the main event level? He seemed to be over with fans and a great athlete. You sort of answered that earlier, but you indicated that maybe he just had trouble connecting with the fans verbally. Why not put a Paul Heyman type with him to allow that to happen? Because Brock Lesnar doesn't really connect with the audience with his promos, but through the magic of Paul Heyman, he does. Right. And I think that sometimes the the idea with Shelton is he's such a nice guy that he should be a baby face and what have you. And maybe doing that as a heel may have helped him. I don't know because he does have a mean streak in him. And I think that Shelton could pull it off as a ba- as a, I mean, as a heel, not as a baby face. Um, but that just never happened. I think that the, there was just a disconnect and sometimes it's an it factor that it's hard to put your finger on. Uh, Joe wants to know, uh, who helped, uh, train coach. He seemed passable in his match. Everybody, the boys, uh, coach would go in and coach would work out. I believe he was working out with Tom at the studio as well. Uh, the training facility, but coach would get to the shows early coach would go on the house shows and he would announce and he would get to the shows early and get in the ring with the boys and, and they would teach him. They would, they would get in the ring and go early and work with him and teach him things every single day. He busted his ass to get as good as he got. And that's hard to do. Coach wasn't this great worker by any stretch of the imagination, but he was safe and he was able to do things that, you know, he probably shouldn't have been able to do. Let's talk about, uh, and this is a good question here. Uh, Brad wants to know, were there any ideas that Mick and Randy had for the match that got shot down by Vince? I mean, they pulled out almost all the stops here besides the fire. And I know we've addressed that. Was there anything else that was pitched that Vince or somebody else said, Whoa, we can't do that. Not that I remember. I mean, good God, they did everything under the sun. So I I don't know what the hell else that, that they could have done, but not that I remember. No, not at all. Uh, let's keep it moving here. Uh, Andy has a question that we got a lot of, of variations of this. And, and I, I get asked this all the time from Justin from sports illustrated. Why were a lot of Canadian wrestlers being announced from the United States at this time? Cause they didn't want to be from Canada. Fuck off. Come on. That feels like Vince McMahon saying, God damn it. They're not relatable. If they're from Edmonton say he's from Georgia. Well, no, some guys, some guys wanted to be from where they lived at the time and not, not go back to that. And, you know, there was, there was a feeling, believe it or not, you know, that guys didn't feel that they would get over if They said that they were from, you know, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, or things like that. Here's my question. They wanted to come from a bigger city. I, I, this is, this is a sidebar, but my brother, one of my older brothers, who's not in a great way right now, but he was born in Tokyo, Japan. And when he was a kid in school, they asked everybody where he came from. And the teacher came to, came to him and said, where, Ken, where do you live? And, or where were you born? And she knew he was born in Tokyo. So she's all excited. She could talk about Tokyo. He says, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. And she called my parents and she said, why did, I thought Ken was born in Tokyo. And he said he was born in Louisville, Kentucky. And they went and asked my brother, I said, Ken, why would you say Louisville, Kentucky? He says, well, who the hell ever heard of Tokyo, Japan? So that same logic with, with the talent is like, no, I want to be from Los Angeles, California. I want to be from Chicago. And that's your call. I want to be clear here. You're saying Vince McMahon did not dictate that someone changed their hometown for the good of their character. Sometimes we wouldn't announce where they were from, but no, a lot of times it's, it's guys want to be where, from where they're living now. Okay. Uh, Chad, the dad says, I remember reading rumors at the time that the main event rematch was going to be a ladder match. Did Bruce ever hear this? Was the rumor ever discussed? It might've been discussed, but, uh, I don't know that it was ever seriously discussed for the three-way 
And I think that we looked at it, what's going to be the better match? And the better match at that point was have that straight, because it was so damn good at WrestleMania, have the straight up triple threat. Uh, Rob wants to know who put together Foley and Orton's pre-match promo. It was incredible, especially Foley. Oh, if it's incredible as me. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Amar wants to know at this stage in Ric Flair's career, was there anyone he was asked to put over that he either flat out didn't want to put over or was hesitant about putting over? I don't remember Rick ever having a problem putting anybody over. It's what he did his entire career. That's how Ric Flair became Ric Flair was by putting people over. So in my experience, you know, Rick would say, gosh, you know, do you, do you really think this will work? And if you say yes, and he's like, okay, I'll go get him over. That was Rick's MO. But I, for me personally, I don't ever remember experiencing Rick not wanting to put anybody over. Luke wants to know, do you have any good Todd Grisham rib stories? Well, we had, uh, some pork ribs in Nashville one time. Come, Come on. Uh, no, I don't. The sports guy wants to know after Mick Foley's amazing performance, were there any plans for him going forward? <laughs> yeah, we used it. No, Mick wanted Mick at this time in Mick's career, Mick was coming back for, you know, short little stints here and, and a stint there and for story and Mick wasn't looking to come back full time. So it was kind of on a case by case basis with Mick at this point. But I guess I, the thing that we're, I think he's thinking, and I could be wrong, but he doesn't come back and um, like a year and change later when he, he appears at, um, one night stand, so he's gone for a while. When you see him go out there and in my opinion, have the best match of the night, I know you disagree. You like the main event better, but that one to me is more memorable. Does Vince go to him and say, God damn pal, we got to do something for summer. Well, you've only got so many of those that you can do. And that that's, that's the problem with doing that kind of shit is, is that, okay, how do you top yourself? You, you got to go away. You got to give it some rest. And it was never intended to, to go on beyond that. And Mick wasn't looking for full-time things. So the, the answer is no, we didn't because we didn't have Mick and this was a one-off story. And if we had the right story for Mick and it made sense, then yes, we would have done something, but it was also along the lines of after that performance, how do you top it for a while? Let him go away. Chris Herman wants to know what is Bruce's opinion on Gail Kim? And why does he think she did not have more success in WWE? I love Gail Kim. I think that Gail Kim's one of the best workers I've ever seen in my life. And, um, she can hang with anybody and she did have success in, in WWE. I think that Gail though was looking to be, um, in a different atmosphere. And I think Gail wanted, you know, she wanted to work all the time. She's a workhorse. She loves wrestling and she loves working a different style. And at the time that style wasn't something that the WWE was looking for. So I think Gail, you know, moved to where she felt, that she was going to be exposed in a better light. But as far as work and as far as human being, uh, to me, Gail's top notch, man. Last one. This is a great question from Adam worth. What was Randy Orton's reaction backstage after the match? The look on his face when he went into the thumbtacks was priceless. It almost looks like he went into shock. Was he in a lot of pain after the match? And did you talk to him? Randy Orton coming back after that match had the biggest grin on his face. Uh, probably, you know, probably because he survived it, but I think that Randy felt how, how great it was and just the reaction and that he had accomplished it. So coming back and everybody in the locker room just applauded the hell out of the effort in that match and how great it was. So I definitely remember Randy coming back and being ecstatic at the performance. Well, I'm ecstatic that we were able to record this week's show. Hope everybody enjoyed Backlash 2004. Coming up next week, John Bradshaw Layfield, a career like nobody else. Um, sort of an interesting start and a very interesting finish and lots of highs and lows in between. Uh, lots of controversy in this one as well. And I'm looking forward to covering it. And I know you are too. Stay tuned next week, next Friday at noon. Something to wrestle is coming your way. But Bruce, before we get out of here, just gotta ask, 
the Viking experience. Is this a rib? A rib? I don't rib. I don't want to be ribbed. All righty. We'll see how it goes, but it, it does feel like it's about that time, Bruce. It is that time, and it is time to say so long, folks. Shaka God. As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults a spring break from house payments. Savewithconrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 32416, equal housing lender, savewithconrad.com.